<clears throat> Last week, my colleague, the Reverend Elizabeth Wynn, a longtime friend of this congregation, preached a, a beautiful sermon lifting up Palestinian voices that offer all of us strength and sustenance amidst the many difficult struggles that we face right now, not least the devastation in Gaza. In that same spirit, our music this week invites us to celebrate liberatory texts from the Jewish tradition and to the ways that these stories have inspired movements for freedom and justice the world over, not least the civil rights movement here in America. And so for our reading this morning, I've chosen an excerpt from the book of Exodus, one of the great freedom stories in which Moses liberates his people from slavery in Egypt. And I want to acknowledge it's a complicated time to read from the book of Exodus because there are some who would read part of its story as divine sanction for Jewish control over all the land, which is now Israel and Palestine. But at its heart, Exodus is a freedom story. And this morning, I'm seeking to reconnect us with its liberatory possibilities. My message is called Ablaze, but not consumed. And our reading is excerpted from chapter 3 of the book of Exodus, verses 1 through 5. It's the story of Moses and the burning bush. Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, and he led the flock beyond the wilderness until he came to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire out of a bush. Moses looked, and the bush was ablaze, yet it was not consumed. So he said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When God saw that Moses had turned to see, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, and Moses replied, Here I am. And God said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cry, and I've come to deliver them. So I will send you, Moses, to Pharaoh to lead my people out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and lead the people out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. Here ends our reading. So what's going on in this story? Moses is a shepherd, tending a flock of sheep in the wilderness. Bored and alone, his thoughts no doubt drift and wander, not unlike the wayward animals under his care. But then something captures his attention. A flash of light, the crackle and smell of dry brush burning. Moses turns and sees a bush on fire, and he thinks, huh, that's strange. And the longer he looks, the stranger the sight becomes because you see the bush is on fire, but it doesn't seem to be burning up. It just keeps burning and burning, giving off light, giving off heat. It was ablaze, said scripture, but not consumed. This intrigues Moses, so he comes in for a closer look. And now that God has his attention, God speaks to Moses and commissions him, charges him to lead his people out of Egypt. And this is how this great epic liberation story of Exodus begins. By the time Moses' people finally make their way to freedom, more than 40 years later, a whole generation will have been born and died. Moses will be dead, never having reached the promised land, and the burning bush where the story all began is nothing more than a footnote. But when reading the story recently, I found myself asking a question. Was the burning bush just God's ploy to get Moses' attention? 
God does like a dramatic entrance in the Bible. <laughs> or is there something more to this bush that is ablaze but not consumed? Could it be that God intended the burning bush to be a kind of object lesson, a model for Moses and his people as they made their long journey to freedom and justice? After all, God could foresee what Moses and, and his people were up against. He knew that they would just narrowly escape Pharaoh's armies, that they would then wander lost for 40 years in the desert. He foresaw that the people would face hardships and, and lose heart and, and turn on one another, and that many of them would die before the struggle was complete. God knew what they faced, and so I wonder if the burning bush this strange plant that burns but is not consumed, I wonder if it isn't God's way of saying to Moses and his people, look, friends, you face a difficult journey in a difficult time. Much will be required of you on this journey. The light of your wisdom and reason, the warmth of your love, the fire of your commitment, these will see you through to freedom, so you better be on fire. But we're in this for the long haul, so burn bright, but burn steady. Don't let the fire devour you. Be like that bush I showed you, ablaze, but not consumed. Huh. I don't know about you, but this seems like sound advice to me. <laughs> Sounds like maybe I could use some of it. Maybe we all could, because friends, we too face a difficult journey in a difficult time. We live at a time when we are confronting threats and injustices that were a long time in the making and that will not be overcome easily or soon. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict. 50 years after Roe v. Wade, and now we find ourselves struggling once again for women's reproductive justice. 250 years after our nation's founding and our democracy is at risk like never before, our Earth itself faces an existential threat from climate change. We've got our work cut out for us, friends. It won't be easy, and it won't be over anytime soon. Sometimes in an election year, I notice that people can succumb to the fallacy that we're running a sprint, if only we can get to November. But I think we've learned by now, haven't we? that this is no sprint we're running. It's a marathon. And the world needs so much from us now, the fire of our passion and commitment, the warmth of our love, the light of our wisdom and reason. We must burn brightly, friends. But we also gotta burn steady because we need to sustain our fire for the long haul. We must be ablaze, but not consumed. What are the things that threaten to consume us? Despair, for one. There have been so many times these last months and years when I've felt the tug of despair. Bitterness and anger, don't get me wrong, there's a place for anger in our struggle for justice, but sometimes our outrage at injustice can eat away at us like a cancer. We can be consumed by apathy, by petty infighting, by overwork and exhaustion, and before we know it, we're not on fire anymore, we're just plain burnt out. How many of you have found yourself in a place like that recently, just feeling a little burnt out from the struggles that we face? I know I have. You 
You know, if the burning bush provides us with one object lesson in sustaining over time the fire of our commitment, there's another mythic member of the plant kingdom that offers maybe a different and less helpful lesson. How many of you remember the book from your childhood, The Giving Tree? <laughs> Anyone remember The Giving Tree? By Shel Silverstein. I still have my copy from when I was a child, and, and several years ago I took it down off the shelf to read it and, because I thought I might share it with my son. For those of you who don't know or remember the story, it's about a selfless tree who befriends a child and who gives and gives and, and, and tears up its roots and chops off its limbs all out of sacrificial love for this, for this child. And by the end of the book, the tree is a mere stump, a dead, sainted stump. <laughs> what were we thinking reading that book to our kids? <laughs> I mean, was the giving tree supposed to be some kind of model for self-sacrificial love? Was the message that in order to serve others, to serve this world that we love, that we've got to give up, that we've got to end up spiritually uprooted and, and chopped limb from limb? Incidentally, I saw recently that, that someone wrote a parody of The Giving Tree with this critique in mind and, and gave it a new title, The Tree That Set Healthy Boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, I've got an idea. Let's be the burning bush and not the giving tree. Let's be ablaze but not consumed. How do we do that? How do we keep our souls supple and resilient on the long road to freedom? How do we sustain that fire and energy and love for the long haul? What's the fuel for our fire? I don't know about you, but as a minister, I keep a running list of habits and practices that I've noticed sustain folks in their commitment to the good things that keep us going when the going gets tough. And this morning, I'm just going to share a few things from my list and invite you to maybe share your list with another congregant after service. First, friends, we must fix our hearts on what we're struggling for and less on what we're fighting against. In our struggles for the good, yes and no are both powerful words. Both have their place. But I believe our yes will sustain us far longer than our no. Because our yes reminds us of all, that all our struggles have their origins in our love and care for someone or something. And that's where we need to stay grounded. We want to save our planet because we love and delight in the earth, not because we're angry at Exxon. We want to smart gun control laws because we love our kids and want to protect them, not because we hate the NRA. But it's easy to get it backwards. I do it all the time. Our anger can burn bright and hot, but it can also flame out real quick. Love, on the other hand, is a fuel that burns strong and steady. To remain in the struggle, stay connected to the love that brought you to the struggle. Friends, we must struggle together and not alone. Over the years, I've noticed that when the world seems at its worst, the people who have struggled most with despair, people I love, are the ones who are spending a lot of time alone in their homes, doom scrolling, or caught up in the anger machine on cable news, it's addictive, and it's soul-crushing. 
Whereas folk who exhibit resilience and hope are people whose lives are grounded in communities of resistance and joy, communities like the church where we can grieve together, share joys together, struggle together. Communities where we can practice forgiveness of ourselves and one another. Because look at we're gonna stumble and fall on the long road to freedom. We're gonna trip over our shortcomings and the limits of our knowledge and experience. We're gonna take the wrong path and double back again. And rather than calling one another out and succumbing to quarrels and infighting, let's be gentle with ourselves and with one another. Let's forgive. Ablaze, yes, but not consumed. And because the road is long and the struggle is difficult, because we're making the journey with good friends and companions, the last thing I want to share this morning is that we must take time along the way to celebrate our accomplishments and find joy. That's why this morning, even though our struggle for LGBTQ equality is far from over, even as our trans siblings face horrible threats, even as the right to marry whom we love may very well be next on the Supreme Court's chopping block, we will and we do pause today and celebrate with Marsha and Susan and so many others 20 years of marriage equality here in Massachusetts. We gotta celebrate along the way. The, the revolutionary activist Emma Goldman said something I love. She said, I don't want to be a part of your revolution if I can't dance, right? I'm with her on that one. If I can't sing along the way or laugh or, or dance, then I don't want to be a part of your revolution. We need to celebrate with one another, finding joy in the midst of struggle. Sometimes we need to go skipping and dancing along the road to the promised land. So love, companionship, joy, forgiveness, dancing, it's all fuel for the fire. Friends, I'll just close by noting that, that Moses was kind of lucky. He got a dramatic burning bush to draw his attention to all these insights. These days, we must settle for a more modest pyrotechnic display. Each Sunday, we kindle the flaming chalice, the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith, the sim a reminder that there is within each of us a sacred flame that burns. It's the fire of our passion and commitment. It's the warmth of our love. It's the light of our wisdom and our reason. It's exactly what the world needs from us now. So may we burn bright and may we burn steady. May we be ablaze, but not consumed. Amen.